This episode of In an Instant is powered by Wasabi. Get 15% off camera batteries with promo code INSTANT. In this episode of In an Instant, we discuss a camera synonymous with photography itself. It's a name everybody knows, from legends of the medium to those who have never owned a camera in their lives. It's plastic, it's fantastic, it's as flimsy as a haystack in a tornado, but it's also magic. Today we discuss the Holga. The kind of photography that would become part of the human being. Press a button and have the picture. Welcome to In An Instant, my name is Ben, and in my hands is a Holga 120N, a toy camera with a lineage celebrating 40 years of unlikely survival in the world of photography. A while back, I opened a poll on my Instagram asking what camera you folks would like to see a video on next. People love voting, so I figured let's do some voting. Well, wouldn't you know it, the Holga was flying through the polls like a hat at graduation. You know, like the, like people throw their hats at graduation. So here we are looking back at 40 years of the Holga. 40 years is pretty young in the long history of iconic cameras. And it kind of surprised me that this camera only first emerged in 1982 out of Hong Kong. It's sort of a spiritual successor to another cheaply made Hong Kong classic, the Diana, which was birthed 20 years earlier in the 60s. In the Diana, the world had a camera that was less a camera and more of a prize you might buy with a few tickets at an arcade or something that might get tossed in as a promotional item. These optically atrocious brittle bricks collected dust on shelves and piled up in trash dumps until the 70s when fine art photographers discovered that the cameras sucked so bad that they were actually kind of sick. The poor build quality and trashy lenses distorted images, leaked a fair bit of light in, vignetted wickedly, and provided an unpredictability that newly anointed Lomographers took a charm to. We now live in a world where the Austrian company Lomography has resurrected the Diana with fresh molds and wide availability, but if you were combing yard sales in the 1970s, you'd be hard pressed to find one. Production had stopped and so many were chucked or destroyed by even light usage that the world now needed a successor for their dreamy lo-fi photography needs. This is where we meet a Hong Konger named Lee Ting Mo. Lee had been employed by Yashica to oversee production in the 60s, but soon moved on to forming his own company that initially produced flash units. Soon, production of flashes became so ubiquitous in China that he had to move on to something else or his company would go belly up. So with a pencil and paper, he sketched out many ideas for the Everyman's Doinker, a sequel to the Diana that could be produced for pennies and sold for a few more pennies. A camera working class Chinese families could snatch up for chicken scratch and snap everyday life with. A noble cause, to be sure. His subversive operation flew in the face of other Chinese manufacturers who were all owned by the government and only sought to produce higher end cameras. Back then, 120 film was the most widely available film type in China. So Lee geared up this chunky medium format toy for that market and unleashed it into society. Unfortunately, society wasn't so kind to it. 35 millimeter film rapidly entered China and the newborn Holga was growing up in a world that didn't give two hoots about it. Not even one hoot. But do not fear, Western civilization loves a piece of crap, and a lomographic revolution started taking hold in the 90s. Suddenly, like the Diana, everybody wanted a Holga for its bizarre inconsistencies, its surreal perspective, its whimsy and unforeseeable imprint on film. It came to represent a counterculture in photography that embraced such tomfoolery, and a cheap choice for those who just wanted to try a medium format camera but only had 30 bucks. You see, cameras had gotten pretty technical, you had the everyman shouting, hey, I wanna do art. And all these knobs and dials are a load of hooey. And I'm lost and I'm scared and I don't know what's going on. And I'm not even supposed to be here. I hope I don't jack. Holga continued to gain ground globally as Lomography pushed its sales overseas. Another notch in the Holga belt took hold in the form of David Burnett's award-winning snap of Al Gore during the 2000 US presidential campaign. Other photojournalists started carrying Holgas with them spreading its unlikely reach from war zones in Iraq to street shots in Japan. The advent of digital photography, a crossbow kill shot to the celluloid industry, flew right past the Holga, which only gained popularity with amateurs. Most digital cameras were not only sterile and pretty crappy, but emerging cell phone cameras sucked even worse and were pretty far flung for most people's idea of an artistic tool. Even with the advent of Instagram, their early filters were more or less designed to make your terrible phone pictures look like the kind of unique compositions that might come out of a Holga. 
with various light leaks and strange colors and vignetting one would come to expect from this beloved curiosity. If you've taken a Shining to film for a little while, you might have learned that every photographic product is ephemeral, and even our most cherished mainstays are bound to meet their demise. That plight struck Holga in 2015, when oversaturation of toy cameras made the Holga a minnow in a large lake of other minnows and other kinds of fish, sucking profits down a waterfall and crashing the business into the boulders below. After attempts at releasing physical phone filters and experimenting with accessories, they shut their doors, with their factory spokesperson exclaiming, and I quote, all Holga tooling has been thrown away and there is nothing available for sale. What a downer. He was also a liar. Molds were soon recovered and the 120N re-entered production two years later at Hong Kong's Sunrise Factory, where the Holga continues to ship around the world five years after its close brush with death. Swimming in this rich history and hardly taking a gasp for air, I started getting restless that I hadn't shot with one of these dang things. So I quickly acquired a Holga 120N. This is one of the newly produced Holgas and is more or less the most basic model. It has a goofy plastic lens capable of shooting at f8 or f11, a fixed shutter speed of 1 100th of a second, and the option for bulb mode, a mask to shoot 645, a viewfinder that gives you a pretty poor representation of how wide the lens really is, manual zone focusing, which has pretty little diagram showing you vaguely where you might wanna rack the lens based on distance, which could be more accurately defined as three feet, six feet, 18 feet, and 30 feet onward. I also acquired a Holga lens, a standalone product which you can toss onto modern DSLRs or mirrorless cameras. There are a bevy of other options in the Holga multiverse that launch and then get discontinued before you even realize it. Many of these variations sprang out of Lee Ting Mo's magical notebook of Holga ideas after the resurrection of its popularity in the early 2000s, which were eventually selling 2 million copies a year over that decade. There's the basic 120N, the 120 GCFN with a glass lens and built-in flash. There's the 35 millimeter bent corners Holga, bent corners meaning extra vignetting, kind of a strange way to put it. And there's the Holga 120 wide angle pinhole camera. Now, these are the options currently available in the US market, but like I said, Holga iterations come and go like the rains down in Africa. Other options that are either discontinued or are soon to be returning to stores or are only available in China are the Holga pan, which takes six by 12 panoramic images, the Holga stereo, which I really want, the stereo pinhole, which nobody asked for, the Holga 120 TLR, which is one of the biggest abominations produced by mankind, and I absolutely love it, peak doinker energy, a 35 millimeter TLR, various 35 millimeter variations, a Polaroid Holga for type 80 pack film, a stereo 35 slash half frame camera that smiles at you, the micro 110, the Holga digital, and a glass lensed variant called the Woka plus a hundred others. In an instant Hall of Famer, Abel Silva, who you've seen on the show a couple times, lent me a few of these monsters from the disfigured Holga family and I had to cop a few of my own because, jeesh, these things are dummy. Now, if you come to acquire one of these toys, the other major bit of fun is the back comes completely off and can be replaced with a 35 millimeter adapter or various other modifications. People go as far as to saw the lenses off and replace them with large format glass most do minor modifications like painting the interior to reduce light leaks, sealing every crevice with tape, adding filters to the lens, and most commonly cover the frame counter window to reduce the potential for light leaks through there. I bought the cheap 120N because I figured I'm, I'm shooting some Holga, I may as well go with the most Holga-ish option. Forget the idea of the glass lens, just shoot some plastic. And for my first couple of rolls, I figured the only thing I would touch is the film counter window, which I covered with electric tape that I need to peel back when I wind to the next frame in the shade. I have since added additional tape. I happened to buy the 120N at a point where Lauren and I were considering moving on from our apartment, and I was getting very romantic about our surroundings, soaking in an area that I really adore and would miss terribly if we'd left. The character of the Holga's unique lens almost automatically conjures nostalgia and made these images feel like memories of spaces, which I was really drawn to. Luckily, we aren't leaving after all, so this series is kind of like my notebook of our favorite spots around the flat. The big variable with the camera so shoddily constructed is exactly how much light will leak through and what your lens will look like. It's a true luck of the draw situation. No two lenses produce the same results, 
making them almost like a fingerprint on your images that is unique to you. I expected the worst, but was happily charmed by the idiosyncrasies of my copy, which produces a fairly sharp center, prominent focus smearing at the top and bottom of the frame, moderate but pleasant vignetting, and only truly horrific light leakage on maybe three out of every 12 frames. In the lottery of Holga buying, I think I got pretty lucky. As I've spent the last six years slowly developing my portfolio of panoramas, I was also very drawn to the Holga pan. This dumper provides a light and affordable alternative to traditional six by 12 roll film backs, which mount to large format cameras. And having already fallen for the Holga look, I really took a shine to this camera for my panoramic adventures. The film I've been using for this series is aptly named FOMA Holga 400 film, which is among the cheapest options available for film these days. I figured if I was shooting on a cheap camera, I should use cheap film, and the film is literally called Holga, so it would be ludicrous to at least not try it. And I've been more than happy with the results I'm getting as I develop it in Kodak HC 110 and Dilution B. For all you Dilution B freaks out there, that should really get you going. The surreal magic and imprint of Holga lensing this kind of reminded me of my beloved Polaroid cameras, which often allow me to dispense with the stringent perfectionism in favor of more impressionistic compositions. The lineage of legends who have taken a liking to this unique piece of history goes to show that its charm knows no bounds. And with a market once again full of Holgas, anyone can grab one for some fun. Thank you for watching in an instant. Go ahead and light seal that subscribe button. Stay tuned for more reviews, breakdowns, guides, and all things instant.